Uh, well, I'm glad California doesn't run the world. And I'm glad that Florida doesn't run. I'm glad that you are sovereign over everything. And I thank you tonight for those who've chosen to be here, those who have health enough to show up. We're grateful, Lord, for uh, that decision. And I pray that you would help us tonight dive into this most Christ-centered book as we attempt to live Christ-centered lives in a Christ-rejecting world. And I ask you to bless those for whom prayer has been mentioned tonight, that people need you physically, Lord, and I pray that you'd be their physician. I'm asking you to touch their bodies, give them everything they need in this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. Colossi, which means punishment, by the way, um, was 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was a small market town. Really doesn't have a whole lot of influence on anything uh, in the New Testament world. And it was situated on the south bank of the Wolf River, which was a tributary of the Meander River. And the word meander is, you know, just kind of meandering around. That's what this river does. It just kind of just is random and um, Colossae is, was located in modern day Turkey in southwest Turkey as a matter of fact and it was in a really really deep valley and all around this little market town were the deep scars of volcanic activity this was a, a pretty major volcanic area of the world as a matter of fact several years after Paul wrote this letter a volcano destroyed Colossae and it's in ruins today. There's nothing there. And uh, Philemon was a member of this church. Remember the book of Philemon? Uh, this was uh, his home church. And uh, in this letter, Paul is going to stress the absolute moral, philosophical, and spiritual preeminence of Jesus Christ over everything. Now, keep this in mind that the church here at Colossae had been injected with the poison of several kinds of false teaching. And I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to walk through the book. Eventually, we want to get to chapter 4, but I want to show you exactly the things that Paul is combating that this church has just been infiltrated with. It's like getting bit by 25 scorpions, you know. You're, just, you're full of this. And... Um, this is, uh, it, it's a magnum caliber handgun pointed directly at the head of false teaching. And so if you're looking for a book in the New Testament that is short, it is concentrated beyond comprehension. I mean, it's just, it, it explodes from the outgo. And uh, it's got two main sections, as a matter of fact. Chapters 1 and 2 deal with the absolute moral supremacy of Christ that's what the first two chapters are this is who he is there's none like him there's none above him he's accountable to no one and then chapters three and four deal with our submission to this supreme Christ and so we've got the supremacy of Christ the first two chapters and then submission to Christ the second two chapters and the believer us I want you to know, and I want you to, I want you to intensely feel that we have been joined in the death of Jesus. You realize that you will never die spiritually. Never. You've already died. Your death is past tense. Now, I'm not talking about our physical death, because it's appointed unto men once to die. We're all going to leave the physical world, and that's a good thing. We're going to escape this world, but spiritually, you have already died because you are in Christ and God has forgotten your sin. That doesn't mean that he has amnesia. It means, uh, well, let's say that, um, let's say I owe Paul $200 and Jamie comes along and says, here, Paul, here's, here's a couple hundred dollars that this for payment. And then I go to Paul and I say, Paul, I need to pay. And he says, forget it. All right, now, what does that mean? Does that mean that he has forgotten that I owe him? Or does that mean it's already been satisfied on your behalf? 
Uh, that's what the word, when God has forgotten our sin, it's not like, hmm, and I, I've, I've heard this preached before. It's like God goes, sin? Hmm, I can't seem to, you know, God is not an amnesiac. He knows exactly what he did, and he knows exactly what we were. It's just simply been removed from the books because your death has already been died. That's kind of an odd statement, I'm aware, but you died 2,000 years ago. And so this is, this is what this book is about. It's a window pane through which we can see the absolute, marvelous, exalted son of the living God and how he sits on top of every intellectual in the world. He sits on top of every philosophy in the world. He sits on top of every religion in the world. Nothing is superior to your Jesus. Nothing. Not in any culture, not in any generation, not in any country, not any person ever. No university, no Nobel Prize winner, no military hero is ever, has ever, or ever will be superior to the Son of God. Now, because of who he is, that chapters 1 and 2 deal with it. This is who he is. This is who your Jesus is. This is who Christ is. Now, because of that, how should we respond to him? If he is this, how should we behave? And that's what the second two chapters are all about. And so uh, we're to live under his authority, under his guidance. We are to be submitted to him, which is the, really the best way to live life. It's the only way to live life uh, in reality. And so, so we're going to walk through some of these uh, moral and theological toxins and diseases that had been injected into these people and this is uh, th this is the armory here that Paul just I mean he's just really, he's a beast in this book all right look in chapter 2 and read with me verses 8 through 10 and we're going to discover that there was philosophy had been injected into this church just simply the reasoning of men the wisdom of men like Socrates and Plato that kind of a thing Positive thinking, more or less. All right, look at verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And the word philosophy means love of wisdom. So don't let anybody spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And so we know this is one thing that they were injected with was this love for the reason and the ability of men to think. He says in verse number 9, and here's why. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How can you improve on the fullness of the Godhead? You, you cannot. And you are complete. That means full in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So he, is, he attacks in this chapter philosophy. Now, don't be impressed with philosophy. Um, I teach philosophy. It's, it's one of the uh, classes this semester. And we're going through the various um, avenues of philosophy, the various layers of philosophy. And, the, you know, the bottom line is there are some brilliant philosophers that have lived and that are still alive right now. Brilliant people. But compared to the wisdom of the Son of God, we're fools. And so this is his, his guardian uh, against philosophy. All right, now... Look in uh, chapter 2, beginning of verse number 11, we're going to fight legalism now. And the idea that you can obey rules and regulations, even laws in, in the Old Testament specifically, and that's how you are made right with God. He's going to fight that. Listen at verse number 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So it is not law. These people were saved. They were uncircumcised because they weren't Jews. 
And that was the real big thing with the Jewish people. You had to become a Jew in order to be qualified to be saved. They didn't say that you had to be a Jew to be saved. You had to be circumcised to be saved. You had to be circumcised and had to live according to Jewish law in order to qualify for salvation. And, and none of that was true, but that was their belief. And so blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And so he talks about this thing of legalism obeying rules and regulations and not eating this and not eating that. He's going to talk about that uh, issue in just a moment as well. But now look in uh, beginning of verse number 18. He is going to combat mysticism. And so we've got philosophy that has been combated. Legalism has been combated. Now look in verse number uh, 18 and 19. He's going to deal with mysticism. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Now, the phrase voluntarily, voluntary humility means self-motivated or fake humility. It's somebody that's trying to be humble. They're not. It's an act that they're putting on. And so he says, be careful about that kind of stuff. And worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head, uh, from which all the body by joints, uh, the uh, joints and bands are talking about ligaments and tendons here, having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. And so this is the uh, the poison of mysticism. Let's just we can be we can be mystics, we can have knowledge that nobody else has, and we can have this elevated consciousness. Now there's one other thing before we get into chapter four, verses twenty through twenty three. He deals with asceticism and asceticism is the idea of you're made holy and righteous by what you wear and what you drink and what you eat and, and that kind of a thing you need to be a monk living up in the mountains so you don't you don't see sin and so beginning of verse 20 he says wherefore if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinance, touch not, taste not, handle not? I said, stop, don't do that. Don't think that you're righteous because of stuff you don't touch and that you don't handle. That's not what makes you righteous before God, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. It's a question. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. And there is this voluntary Humility, it's will worship. They're not worshiping God. This is fake worship. Right, this is fake news. All right, uh, And humility and neglecting of the body. Don't take a bath. You don't, you don't uh, take care of yourself. You neglect. Not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. There's nothing wrong with eating healthy food. Nothing wrong with sleeping in a comfortable bed. Uh, these people thought the way to God is by punishing yourself. And by starving yourself and, and that, that kind of nonsense. Now we get to chapter number 4. And uh, this, uh, this chapter is going to contain some instructions <clears throat> excuse me, concerning our duties to those people who are not saved. Outside the church. Outside of Christ. And uh, how are we to treat the lost? How does the church... In 21st century in North America, how do we deal with the LGBT movement? How do you deal with people who fight for abortion tooth and nail? How do you deal with people that are socialist? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with communist? How do you deal with an, uh, with an atheist, an agnostic? Do we ignore them? Do we, we, you know, we can get in this holy huddle and just ignore everybody around us. We can, we can just speak the language of Zion like code words that they don't understand. We can keep our faith to ourselves and let's just let the world tumble straight into hell. We can do that without trying to engage in our culture. And a lot of Christians do that. A lot of churches are nothing more than uh, escape zones where, where Christians go to get away from it all. 
and at least there for a few hours, you know, they don't have to deal with that. Well, um, that's, that's not going to happen. We, we deal with people every day of our lives. Now, in chapter 4, he's going to give us uh, some direction. How do you deal with things that are not right? How do you do that? How do you deal with people that don't believe what you believe? You realize that you're, we, are not a real well-liked subgroup of the population in North America now. You're aware that, that Christians are looked at as basically the cause of a lot of problems. You realize how jaded you people are? You remember in 2010 when North Carolina voted that uh, the only legal domestic relationship between a man and a woman in marriage you remember the oh my goodness mainstream media went nuts i remember some of the headlines north carolina where hatred is alive bigotry is alive the the folks that that voted for that were called human garbage i've got the headlines in a folder at the house now let me ask you a question are you a hater because you disagree with that which is in violation of God's word. Are you a hater because of that? No. Absolutely not. But this is what you're called. And you're aware of that. You are called homophobic. Well, homophobic is a misnomer. It means scared of. Uh, hydrophobia. Fear of water. Uh, I'm not afraid of a homosexual, and so that's a, that's a mislabeled uh, subgroup, at least as far as, as we're concerned. And so, but really, how do you deal with people who just despise what you believe? What do you do with them? Well, look at verse number one. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Slavery was a reality in the Roman Empire in the first century, and apparently these Colossian people had folks that were their servants. How are you supposed to treat these people? You give them what is just and equal. You take care of their needs like you take care of your needs. Verse 2, continue in prayer. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all also, with all praying rather, also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. That's why I'm in jail now. Because I have I have preached the gospel. And he said, if you would pray that while I'm in jail, that that prison doors would be open and I would be able to get to the gospel into the highest reaches of the Roman Empire, and he did. The Roman emperor knew who Christ was because of this guy right here. And uh, the way the, Rom- the Romans were pretty, they were brutal. Oh, my word, these people were brutal. Um, they would chain you to guards. There, there were two guards. But they would cross your arms. And so your left arm was chained to the guy on the right, and your right arm was chained to the guy on the left. Pretty uncomfortable, but this is, this is the way they did you. And I can just about imagine that when the guards went to look at the schedule, it was like, oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> all For eight hours, all you're going to hear about is Jesus. And, uh, but he won a lot of the Praetorian Guard to the Lord while he was right there, you know. And, and uh, so now we get down to verse number uh, five. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And the word walk means to conduct your behavior. Now, I I meant to have a piece of paper of thing tonight. Anyway, I want you to imagine uh, Highway 17. Uh, Highway 17 starts up north and goes way down south. It's a continual flow of asphalt. Uh, Let's say that's like time. Time is just this continual flow. Well, time is the order of events in sequence. And so we've got this long stretch of time. Now, we don't, we don't live life like you, you get born and then you die and you never have any stops along the way. That doesn't happen. There are a lot of crossroads on Highway 17. 
uh, Main Street's one of them, right here, it runs in front of the, of the building. And you've got all of these crossroads just in Wachula that cross 17, punctuate 17, all up and down. All right, now, verse number, with that in mind, verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, and that is outside the church or lost people. Conduct yourself with wisdom to people that don't know Christ, redeeming. And the word redeeming means to seize the market. Um, to exhaust all possibilities in your investing. Uh, now, in, in contemporary terminology, it would be like, here's a guy and he's, he's investing in the stock market. And he's got some money that he wants to invest in this. And so he's, he's looking, he's exhausting all possible places to put his money. He's looking for the best investments. And, and so this is not just uh, redeeming the time. It doesn't mean time in general, you know, from birth to death. Talking about these crossroads, these intersections of time, these contacts that you have with people every day, that's the crossroad. These conversations you have with people at Winn-Dixie and Walmart and the gas station and, and the restaurants and on the job, these are crossroads. These are just little intersections of time, and we all have them. Nobody lives without these intersections just from birth to death. Life is made up of intersections. And so Paul says in verse number 5, when you have these intersections, take advantage, and that's what the word redeem means, to seize the market at the time, redeeming the time. And again, time is these intersections. And so... The Lord gives you intersections along your road of life. Your, your spouse is one of them. That's a, that's a pretty major intersection. Your kids, pretty major intersection. A lot of us have grand, grandkids, major intersections. Um, folks still work. So you've got bosses. You've got coworkers. You're here in this church. We know dozens of people in the church. There, there are more intersections. You have family probably that live out of state. More intersections. You have, you have people that you know in town, friends that you hang out with and go to eat with. and More intersections. Thousands and thousands of intersections. We are told that the average American adult has a friendship circle of 250 people who have a friendship circle of 250 people, of 200, now that's, that's average. Some know more, some know less, but what I'm telling you is this. If this is the only intersection of our time that we're concerned about, we're missing 99% of our life. See, this is the easiest place in the world to be a Christian, isn't it? Right here. This is the easiest place. There's no pressure to do the right thing here. When somebody prays here, we're not like, oh, oh no, you can't, you can't pray in the name of Jesus here. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what we do here. Somebody reads the Bible here out loud. One of you do or I do. Uh, nobody says, oh, no, 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 we can't read the Bible in here. Yes, we can. That's exactly what we do. Can't talk about Jesus. That's exactly what we do. So this is the easiest place to do the right thing. This is just one of those intersections so he says now in verse number five that I am to seize the market I am to exhaust all possible intersections with people that are lost let your and here's how you do it let your speech now he's going to tell us here's your here's how you engage in these intersections let your speech be always with grace now the word grace means Sweet, sweetness, pleasantness, or courteousness. So how am I to talk to people? How am I to talk to a gay man or woman? With, with courteousness. Yeah, I'm not to say, well, you filthy, you queer? You, what, what? Oh, get away, you know. Don't do that. You don't do that. Well, the ultimate goal is to establish a relationship that will draw them to Christ. Where else are they going to hear the truth? 
Where else are they going to be confronted? Where else will they find people that love them enough to confront them with the truth of what they're doing and where it will ultimately lead them? Beside coming into contact with the believer who's in Christ and the Word is in him. And so verse number 5 says, let your speech be always with grace. Talk to your spouse with pleasantness, sweetness, courteousness. That's your biblical responsibility. You talk with your children with sweetness, courteousness, pleasantness. People that do you wrong, sweetness, courteousness, pleasantness. He says that you are to season your words. I love the word season. It means to spice. You spice your words well. It's like we're fixing a verbal souffle. And you've, you've, oh, it is just so wonderfully prepared, and it's beautiful, and it is spiced so well. You season it. It isn't seasoning sort of the, you, you know, you've, you're, uh, it is. You know, you're fixing a big prime rib. Now, you can, you can put it on your smoker or on your grill without anything you can do that and it would be okay but you find that right combination of ingredients for seasoning and you rub that see oh my word that's what that's what's going to draw oh I want some more of that can I have another piece of that that smells so good that tastes so good and so when people talk to us and we talk to them we should be so courteous that when they leave, they're like, I want some more of that. That was good. That encouraged me. That built me. I like that. I don't agree with what, what that guy believes, but I, I like what he said to me, and I like the fact that he encouraged me, and he, he bragged about my kids or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Prepare the meal of your conversation with courteousness and spice your words so that people are like, man, you can, you know, uh, what, what's the name of this place up in Bowling Green, the barbecue place on the right, the Smoking Joe's. You know what that guy does, don't you? He's a sneaky weasel, what he is, <laughs> and it works. He'll fire that grill up when there ain't nothing on that grill, and you go by there, and it's like, oh, my. Goodness. And then when he puts something on it, it's sure enough, you know, what's he doing? Trying to draw you in. And it works. It's just like, ah, oh, that smells so good. I want to be, and I think I'm speaking for everybody in here. I want to be the kind of Christian that people want to talk to, even if though, even though they're outside. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to talk to them like they're dirt or trash. I don't care what they're involved with. You know, they may be drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, gay. I, I, you know, I don't. Does it matter? Didn't didn't Paul say to some of these people, and such were some of you? So this is where you came from. This is where everybody comes from. Everybody comes from the wrong side of the track initially. And then somebody, well, let's just stop and open the floor here for a minute. What person in your life served as this prime rib that was so well seasoned that, that you just, you were drawn to them and you wanted to find out more about what they believed? Who's got a name? My dad was, was one of them in my life. Who else? Robert Griffin. Okay. Okay. David Gurgle. Okay. 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 E.L. Johns. Anybody else? God bless you for that, man. Uh, your mom. Okay. Somebody, 
somebody has been that prime rib in your life that got your appetite aroused and you wanted to be with them and when that happens what an open door that is now when somebody gets you have this relationship with somebody and they they come into your life is it okay to talk about sports or the weather I think those are those are good openers those are good openers but ultimately where do you want to lead them you ultimately want to get to the heart of their heart and talk to them about their relationship with the Lord. And this is, this is what the open door is for. So Paul says, pray that I'd have an open door to begin conversations with people and to talk with people. That I would have my words seasoned, spiced with salt. And again, um, salt does a bunch of stuff. It, it preserves it flavors and it creates thirst. If, if you salt something, it's going to make you thirsty. And, and there are some foods that you can eat that create thirst in you for several days. It does me. I can eat shrimp and be thirsty for two days. I don't know if it's because they live in salt water, but what makes y'all thirsty? What foods? French fries? You, you eat French fries? They'll make you thirsty? Bacon. Okay. Bacon. Every, everything makes you thirsty. All right. All right. There are, some, there, there are some foods that are just, that's the nature of that food. It, what it does, uh, it pulls water out of your cells. It's kind of like Epsom salts. Epsom salts pull water out of your cells. Salt does the same thing. That's why they used to put salt on the meat. They would salt their meat, and it would pull all the water out of it and get in that salt. And that, that salt, the meat would be encased in salt. And it'd be hard as Japanese arithmetic. You'd have to break it off with a hammer. I've seen my granddaddy bust it off with a hammer uh, because it had drawn all the water, and the meat would just dry as baby powder. And it's good, but it's salty, and it will create a thirst in you. And so verse number 6 says, Let your speech be always pleasant, seasoned, or spiced with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Everybody deserves a well-prepared answer. So when somebody talks to me, I, I need to keep in mind, don't give them a smart aleck answer. Don't whack them off at the knees. Don't, you know what I'm saying? Don't do that. Don't, don't get your fangs out and just crawl all over people. Don't do that. Because they're probably not going to come back. And, and let's, say a, let's say a boss does that to a coworker or a worker. Uh, I mean, just, he just scrapes him over and over. Well, the guy, you know, he's, he's got to work there. But he doesn't have to counsel with the boss. He doesn't have to hang out. You know what I'm saying? That there can be just this distance. And we don't want that. You know, we don't want people to say, oh, that guy goes to Riverview Heights. That's, that's where they don't like folks like us. And again, um, this, um, this group at CPM, every time I go now, they say, we enjoy coming to your church. Your people make us feel, and here's the word, valuable. We feel valuable when we go there. And I was like, praise the Lord. That just, that just. I was so proud of you guys. I'm telling you, it was just like, yes. Um, and, you know, I've, they've told me that they've, they've been to places before, and they were told. This was not the feeling they got. These, these were the words that, <laughs> that were used with reference to them. You got yourself in this fix. You get yourself out. They were told that in a church. And they were like, Really? Uh, I expect that of the world. I don't expect that among God's people. And so, uh, what, what kind of a conversational chef are you? So we've got this big pantry full of words. Matter of fact, uh, there's a million plus vocabulary words in the English language. A million. 
Not all of them are appropriate. I'm aware of that. There are words like Seminole. <laughs> Just highly inappropriate word. We, we don't <laughs> now get a grin back there. All right, now get a grin. Uh, you know, there are words that are that you just don't use. Well, that's very few compared to the million plus that are appropriate and, and good. Now, I think it's good. The more appropriate words I know, the more ingredients I can put in my conversational souffle. Because people get tired of eating the same thing all the time, don't they? That's why I think we need to know what's going on in the world. I think you need to have a good broad-based education and be able to talk about things other than just one thing. Um, John, I've been thrilled to death that John and Irene have, have joined us. John's a unique guy. He's got some interests, hobbies, that, that we have in common. I, I have... I have this thing about knives and always have. Well, guess what John has? He's got some really cool knives. And, uh, but when we get together, that's not all we talk about. Then you, you have friends that you have things in common with. And they're, they're good openers. But, you know, you want to eventually take them to the cross and bring your testimony. When you come, bring your testimony. We're not just talking about some philosophical thing here. We're talking about something that happened to me and to you. So bring that when you come. And when you come, come with this barrage of, uh, it's like a garden of topics to talk about. Different colors and, and fragrances. And, and you want to be well-versed and well-rounded. And, and I think you need to be well-educated in things. Because people have an interest in different things. And be able to discuss those things with those people. But ultimately, again, you want to take them by the heart and lead them to the cross. And I think the, the way that, that that is done best is by knowing what temperament they are. Knowing how to encourage them. Know what their weaknesses and their strengths are. Stay away from their weakness. And you say, well, how do you do that? By building their strength. If you build their strength, they'll stay away from their weakness. Now, if you want to deal with them in their weakness, pick on it. Make fun of it. Point it out. And if you do that, you're going to deal with that guy. If you don't want to deal with that guy, then find his strengths and deal with that. Um, I'll give you a quick personal illustration and, and it's, it's for illustration purposes only we were coming back from Bradenton what's today Wednesday Monday I guess and we stopped and grabbed some lunch and there was a I like bells it's a clothing store and there was a pair of shoes that I've been looking at and I want to get a pair of shoes and uh, so we we go to bells and I find the shoes but I don't have my size they had like 13s and 26s and stuff that like but I found the color that I wanted but it was like a 13 and so I took it up to the lady uh, the, the cashier lady and she was on the phone and she was having a hard time with this guy on the phone and she was saying yes sir yes sir I understand but our store policy is you get the 25 percent when you you know she was trying to explain and she'd stop yes sir I understand what you're saying. Right, correct. All right, that's correct. But our store policy, and she had to do that three or four times. And I was, I was watching her, and she was going, you know, she was rolling her eyes. So she, she was getting a little aggravated, but she was just handling this so well. And when she hung up, I said, ma'am, you handled that with such grace and wisdom. Thank you for what you just did for that guy. And she said, well, he just wouldn't, I just, yeah, I said, I understand, I understand, but you handled it really, really well, and I compliment you on that. And so I showed her the shoes, and I was going to have to order them, and she said, uh, sir, do you have a, a coupon? And I was like, what? <laughs> well, I don't have a coupon. 
Uh, I said, no, ma'am. I didn't laugh at her. I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a coupon. She said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my manager's code, and that'll knock off another 25%. They were already on sale. She said, I'm going to knock off another 25%. And I said, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Now, I'm convinced. Now, you understand I'm not scratching my back. I'm just telling you. Had I not said to her over something better. Now, that was none of my business. You understand? That was none of my business. But I acknowledge the fact, I think she handled it really well. And I got 25% <laughs> off from doing that. So, and I could have said, I think you handled it really well, ma'am. Well, so now that's right. No, she didn't do that. But I'm telling you, people respond to being treated with courtesy. And if, if you work in any kind of a job where you deal with the public, Jamie, Sarah, uh, Mike, Chelsea, you're the, the teacher, and uh, if you work with people, you deal with all kind of fools, don't you? I mean, they, they expect you to drop everything you're doing and rush to them immediately, take care of them right, right now, and they just feel like they own you. And uh, there's a, I think there's a right way to handle every wrong situation. And I think Paul knew that right way. And that right way, courteous. Be courteous to people. And what, what people do, they will match your tone and your volume. You ever notice that? Somebody comes in and, I don't like this. Well, I don't care. I am really mad now. Well, you get, you know, and it's just like, I will see your 100 decibels and raise you 20 decibels. And it just, but what happens when you keep calm and courteous? Now, they may start off in a hurricane, but you can have your hand, you can control that conversation by being courteous. Now, Paul didn't necessarily say in, in these verses, dump all of your doctrine on them. Start debating with them. Pour all of your belief. He didn't, he didn't say it. He just said, be courteous. That may come later. You know what I'm saying? You can't kick the door down in people's lives and immediately start pouring your doctrine all over the floor. That, that doesn't work. People won't appreciate that. You've got to be invited to that level of their life. You know, you may can talk about their car or their kids. Everybody likes to talk about the things that they're interested in. But quite often, there's a vault door when it comes to the deeper issues of their lives. You're not welcome there yet. Not yet. Be patient, be courteous, and guess what will happen one day? they'll open that vault door and for the most part there won't be anything in there people are they're empty and y'all know that well as I do people's lives are just empty they, they look full and they look fun filled but they need who you know they need who you know so getting back now it's chapter 4 verse number 5 walk in wisdom toward them that are without Seize the market of every intersection, every conversation. Grab it like it was an investment. You can't let it go. You, you've, you've got to be courteous. You've got to be kind. Don't let them go without leaving that with them. And let your speech be always with grace, seasoned or spiced with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And so this is Paul's uh, recipe or touching the lives of other people. Uh, let, let's not avoid contact with people who don't believe what we believe. Don't avoid contact with them. You say, well, preacher, I don't, I don't have enough Bible knowledge to debate. You don't need Bible knowledge to debate. How much knowledge do you have to have to be courteous? You have to have a college degree to be pleasant. You don't need that. You see, people... If they're treated like that, they will give you a whole lot of room to not be a professional theologian. 
You understand what I'm saying? They won't expect. Now, if you argue with them and you, you charge against them, they're going to expect you to be a Ravi Zacharias. And none of us are. But if I am kind and courteous, they're going to understand. You know, this, this guy might not know everything about the Bible, but I like him. He's kind, and he treats me like I'm important, treats me like I'm valuable. That, to me, is just, I don't think you can beat that with people. And so, and y'all have always been that way. Uh, here at church, it's very friendly. Uh, this is just, a, uh, there, there's a unique atmosphere in this church. Y'all don't see it because you're here all the time. You think this is normal, and it is here. Really? Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, I thank you for sharing that because you need to hear that from somebody beside me. You expect me to say it. <laughs> I mean, that, I'm your pastor. But uh, you would think that, should that not be average everywhere in a church? Churches? I mean, this, yeah, just from one church to another. They preach the Bible. These are God's people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It ain't that way. And so I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on continuing to do that. When we have visitors come through these doors, I just jump on them um, and let them know. We're, thank you for being here. You are so, so welcome here. Um, and and when, when everybody does that, it just creates an atmosphere. And you can tell people anything if you're kind to them. You, know, you can. If you're courteous and you've earned the right and you've got to earn the right to say some sharp things. And by sharp, I, I don't, I'm not talking about just being rude, but just being able to present truth to people. And if you do it in a way, that, I mean, you can, the truth can just jostle their wagon. And after they've been jostled, when they say, thank you, I appreciate that, you know you've done it the right way. Uh, so anyway, all right. Thank you all for being here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, green beans on the back pew. Good, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else got vegetables or fruit they're trying to get? I don't have okay. <laughs> but I would like for us to pray, especially for my brother-in-law that's going to leave this week. Uh, Diane sent me a text this afternoon at 4:51. Um, she said they have to move into CCU around three o'clock. His heart rate went to 200 and stayed there. Right after they got him into CCU, it went back to normal. They're running some kind of drip that they can shed chemicals and it's very good. And um, she said it's okay right now, but it, in the eight bit amount, his blood sugar went 440 degrees a few minutes ago. <coughs> so he was Whoa. down to about 800 just this morning. So good grief, 442. That's pretty high. That's yeah, that's not good. All right, yeah. Well, let's do that right now. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, oh, and she said her granddaddy called at 346 this morning um, because he took him by he was trying to get the bus out of there by his left hand side, and they couldn't find the call in, so he's very disoriented. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. All right. These, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, let's do that. These dear sweet people are flying the coop Saturday morning. And uh, so let's pray for a safe trip. I think Lyle and Pat uh, are there. I think they, uh, they, were, they made it to Illinois last night. And so they had another, I think, 600 miles to go. And so they're either there or really, really close. And uh, so... Well, God bless y'all as you travel. Uh, I hope y'all don't get stuck in some hail and snow and ice up there. I, just, I hope you don't have that. All ours is melted here. You, you might notice that. <laughs> All right. What is his first name? Ronnie. Ronnie. I was thinking Donnie. Okay, Ronnie. All right, let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, we bow to worship you as our Father, as our Redeemer, 
And Lord, we come to you tonight with needs. We can't do anything about these things. We're, our hands are tied. But not really. Because our heart is kin to you. We're kin to you by the blood of your son, Jesus. And my prayer tonight is that you bless Ronnie. Lord, there's nothing we can do to help him. But you can. And so we just surrender his health and his life into your hands and bring his heart rate down and his sugar down. I pray that you bless Betty's request. Lord, you know the exact need. And I, I pray, Lord, that if you choose in your wisdom and sovereignty not to change our physical circumstances, that you give us grace to accept what you won't change, that you change our hearts. So, Lord, we ask you, first of all, just to touch lives. Give us help. And I pray that you would, uh, Lord, watch over these dear folks as they go back home. I ask you to give them safety and security on the highway. Be their bodyguard. Be their protector and their, their usher and their escort back home. Thank you so much for their love for you and for us and our love for them. What a, what a pleasure it is to know them. And I pray, Lord, that you would just simply escort us through our lives until the day that you call us home. And may we be courteous and pleasant and kind to every person we meet under every circumstance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, y'all have a great week.